fun. Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. Today we're going to give you a message. It's not just for dads, so don't worry. Uh, and, uh, but I hope that it'll encourage you today as a dad uh, or as a mom or as a Christian and anywhere in between. We're glad to see you this morning. We're going to talk about uh, you know, what God does with our confidence when we have a relationship with Him. Let me ask you this question. Do you ever struggle with feeling out of place? You ever struggle with feeling that maybe you're not enough? Uh, you think about, you know, what you could do better all the time. You think about how you messed up. Maybe you replay some of those things in your mind, those things that you said or did, and you think, I, I could never measure up to do what I should do. You know, uh, back in the Old Testament, Moses, believe it or not, who wrote some of the, the first five books, we call them the Pentateuch, uh, he struggled with that uh, for good reason. And um, so he's out in the desert, there's a burning bush, and uh, God comes to him. And in that story, Exodus 3, we're going to just pick up a few of these points from there, and then we're going to go over to Philippians to talk about how God can give us confidence. Here's what he said, God said to him. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people Israel, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And today we're going to talk about how we need God's confidence to live greatly. Now, do you know what these are? Anybody know what these are? What, what, what? Bar strippers? Wire strippers. Somebody's very country. Wire strippers. Well, these are wire strippers. Let me tell you what we call these in my house. Those electric-y thingy tool that I need. Can you go get it for me? They say, with the electrical stuff. Now, here's what I know. How many of you have ever stripped a wire without using these? Everybody has, right? Okay, now, if there's a dentist in the room, you might want to close your eyes. How many of you have ever stripped a wire with your teeth? Now, I got one more question that relates to me. How many of you have ever discovered that the wire was on when you went to do that? Yes, good to see my people right here. We're good. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Been shocked a few times. We're... I think you're the one who brought me my first sniffer, right, that says, that's on, don't touch it, because she's heard enough stories. She said, every time you do electric, please use this to make sure it's off. Now, here's the truth. You can strip a wire without wire cutters, but it's hard. You can live life without a relationship with God. You can even force your way to this self-confidence that the world gives. But can I tell you something? It is a lot more work. And in some cases, it's dangerous, right? It's a... The truth for us is in order to really know and be confident, we have to know God's presence in our lives. And so today, my main point today is going to be this. You can be confident, not because of you, but because he's with you today. Now, one of the favorite parts that people love about the Father's Day sermon is, is because it's the shortest sermon of the year. And you know, there's no such thing as a bad, short sermon. I had so many people come up to me tonight and say, that was a great sermon. And I thought, yeah. Okay. This week I was teaching Elise, uh, she was going to take her driver's test, my last 16-year-old. And uh, so my dad taught me how to drive in Miami, or as we like to call it, my jammy. And one of the ways he did it, I never told you this story probably, but literally he took me on this little back road and all of a sudden there was this little ramp and he said, you better start to accelerate, you are now on the expressway. Go. That was like throwing your kid in the water, but anyway, so... I've taught Elise to drive for the last year. We've driven all kinds of places. We've practiced three-point turns. Did you know kids don't have to parallel park anymore? Just, yeah, I know. It's just not fair. Don't go to Coral Gables. But anyway, so, um, so we, uh, uh, the night before her test, she said, I just, I just want to do a few things. I want to try to practice the three-point turn, a few other things. So we went around the corner from our house on this street that's nice and wide, but I think four people live on the street. It's about three miles long, and there is never anybody on it. I mean, it's got the yellow lines, it's got the whole deal, but there's hardly anybody ever on that street. And so we got on that street, and she was driving, and as she started going down that street, she said, wow, I remember being nervous when I first went on that, this street. 
And I remember there was one time when we first started, she started driving and she got on that street and somebody got behind her and she literally had to pull into the grass and let the person pass because it freaked her out so much to have somebody near. This time somebody got behind her and she's just like, you wait your turn or whatever she said, you know. And we went to the end of the street and that person turned into the three houses, you know. And she did her three-point turn, did great. And then the next day she went and took her driver's test and unlike me, she passed it the first time. You probably didn't know that about me either, but it didn't surprise any of you. I didn't see anybody going, no, really? You failed it the first time? She used to be scared of the road because she had never been on it, but now she knew she could do it. When you learn to walk with God and you know his presence, you go through trials and struggles. And even on the days that you feel like, I'm not sure I'm going to make it, you remember what he's done. So let's look at these things. Number one, the reason that we struggle with confidence is often, what are you doing over there? I, oh my goodness. He brought the biggest, most sugary donut of the day. Is your kidney doctor okay with that? Is he good? Okay. All right. Oh, your wife's not here today to keep an eye on you. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I'll keep going. Number one. All right. We're chained to our past. Have you ever been dealing with a situation or even woken up in the middle of the night remembering something that happened years ago? Have you ever done the thing where you wake up in the middle of the night and you remember something that you haven't thought of in years and it's, it's never something good? You never wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, that was so pleasant to remember. And, and as humans, many times we go to the negative. Listen to what uh, Moses says here, Exodus 3.11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? What was Moses remembering? I'm the guy who you said was going to do this and I killed somebody and I've been out here uh, with the sheep for all these 40 years and now you're talking to me? God, you, you, who? What? What? If we're not careful, we begin to feel that way. Who? Am I? Anytime that God asks you to step up and to do anything for him, whether it's encourage somebody, whether it's tell one of your neighbors your faith story, how you came to Christ, whether it's to encourage somebody at work, the enemy will say, who do, who do you think you are? So what do we do with that? Forget the past and focus on his calling. In Philippians, it says this, brothers and sisters, I know that I have not yet reached that goal, but there is one thing I always do. Forgetting the past and straining towards what's ahead, I keep trying to reach the goal and get the prize for which God has called me through Christ to the life above. See, the only way that you can move forward is if you are able to put the past behind you. Can I tell you the number one thing that people... This is, this is why forgiveness is so important. The number one thing that I believe holds people back is a lack of forgiveness. Because the truth is, if you're thinking about somebody who hurt you yesterday, or hurt you last week, or hurt you last year, or hurt you 10 years ago, you have a hard time living in the present because you're still mad at somebody. You're living back wherever that is. Now, listen carefully. I will say this every time I talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting. There's nowhere in the Bible that says forgive and forget. For some of you to forget, you would have to have a lobotomy. You went through terrible things. Okay? Doesn't mean forget. It doesn't mean you have to restore that person into your life. If you go to a car place and they mess up your car and then they don't take care of it and they rip you off, you don't have to say, I forgive you, take my car again and let me pay you more money that you don't deserve. No. You can forgive them and move along. There are people in your life that hurt you that will never ask forgiveness. The Bible doesn't say to wait for them to ask forgiveness. You Forgive them anyway. Some of you can't live today because you're concerned or waking up or going back and replaying that tape of that person that hurt you over and over and over. So I want you to learn to forgive. Why? So that you can say, God, what do you want me to do today? You can't love the people who are in your life today while hanging on to the anchor of bitterness from yesterday. Number two, we fear the future. Now, one good time that it is good to anticipate is when you're driving. 
It's good to anticipate. If you drive on I-4, you need to anticipate that people who merge will never look. They will just merge, right? That even happens on 995, right? You're driving on 995. If you stay in the right lane and you think, oh, they'll see me, <clears throat> so what do you do? You anticipate. You slow down or speed up, you know? It's one of the things you learn. But I will tell you that too many times we have gone ahead and we bring our fear into whatever God wants us to do. If God wants you to help out at the port ministry, Steve, by the way, had a whole bunch of people show up at the port ministry to get trained yesterday, and that's coming along great. And if, and if you're wanting to do that, one of the things that will happen, well, what if? What if this happens? What if this happens? Listen to what Moses said. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? I mean, he's already predicting what could go wrong. Oh, they might ask, i got to have an answer for this. i got an answer. Hey, can I tell you something about life? Even if you plan as much as you can plan, there will still be things that you won't have the answer for when they come. You know, one of the nice things about being a pastor that I've taught people is that even pastors don't have all the answers. And the more people get to know me, they think I've got more answers than he does. I like that, right? So they come to me and they say, Eric, what about this? And I go, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe this, but I, I don't know. And it's okay to not know sometimes, and it's okay to know that in situations, there'll be things that come up that you're not ready for. But when God's with you, you don't have to worry about it. So what can we do? Be confident in God's strength in you. Philippians 1.6. This one you should memorize if you haven't yet. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion to the day of Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? It means if you're a Christian... You should not be where you were yesterday. You should be able today look back and say, I'm growing. And you should realize that next year, you should still be growing. And if you're 70 years old, you should still be growing. And if you're 80 years old, you should still be growing. And if you're 90 years old, you should still, until the day of Christ Jesus. That means one day when I say, what does this button do? And then my next words are, Jesus, what are you doing here? He's working on me between now and then. To the day I see him face to face, he is working on me, and he's always working on me. So the day you get frustrated and feel like I am not enough, know that God's not done with you yet. He's still working on you so you can be confident. Number three, we focus on ourselves and our fears. We focus on ourselves and our fears. Exodus 4.10, Moses says this. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I love that. Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. And many theologians believe that Moses stuttered. He at least thought he stuttered. He was worried about who he was and what he could do. He did not feel like enough. He did not feel like he deserved the position he was in. Guess what? That meant he was right where God wanted him. I'll never forget years ago when I was a youth pastor, my first full-time position at a church, they took me to a pastor's conference. And I went to this pastor's conference and I was dressed like this. And everybody else was in suits and ties. I think I had one suit and tie at that time. Now I have different sizes of suits and ties. Oh, that must be about 10 years ago. That one's pretty big. Oh, that must be 20 years ago. That one's really small, right? So I went to this conference, and I'll never forget, we were in these meetings, and I would look around, and most of the guys had this kind of voice. It's good to see you today, brother. How are you doing? I think they spoke in King James even. How art thou today? Good to see thou. And then they would pray, Oh, Father God in the heavenly realm with the, you know, and that, things I can't even think that fast, right? And I'll never forget, we were in a time of worship, and we began singing. And as I stood there, I thought, you know what? I don't think I should be here. I don't think I should be a youth pastor. I don't think I should be on staff at a church. And I sat down. And every once in a while, somebody say to me, do you think God speaks? And I can tell you that that day he did. Because here is what I heard, as clear as a bell. Eric, I did not call you to be them. I called you to be you. 
Would you please remember that God did not call you to be anyone else? Steve's going to be ordained here in a few months at our church as a pastor. And can I tell you, he's not going to be like Eric. Thank God for you and me, right? When, when, <laughs> you didn't have to amen so loud, Gary. Yeah, I knew it was Gary. Did you like that? When Rodney speaks, you know, he doesn't share like I, and it's okay. God hasn't gifted you to be me, and guess what? He hasn't gifted me to be you. So be who God's made you and use the gifts he's given you. Surrender to God's will in all things. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, listen to this, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You ever say, if that happened to me, I would just die? You ever say that? That's how people feel sometimes when God calls them to do something. If I do that, I'll just die. I don't like being around people. or I, I don't want to go on that mission trip they're having in September. You know, and I, I, I don't really like that. I, I can't join a small group because I, you know, I might talk to somebody. You know? What is God calling you to do? And you say, God, no matter what I do for me to live is Christ. Listen to this quote by Francis Chan. I think it's in the notes today. Did I put it in the wrong place? I put it in the wrong place. Okay, we'll go to the next. I'm going to tell you the quote by Francis Chan. Here we go. He said, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Too often we're pursuing things that don't matter. Number four, let's just be honest. We're not true servants. We love to tell God, oh God, I love you. And then he asks us to do something and we go, uh. Let's, you know, here's the deal. Dads, I heard Tom Papa say this, and I thought, that's so accurate. So many dads have said to me, and they, and they all said, that's true. They said, you know, it's Father's Day. You know what we want to, on Father's Day? To be left alone. Just give me a hug, tell me you love me, and then let me do whatever I want. Leave me alone. And sometimes when God asks us to do something, the truth is, we're like, God, you know what? Just leave me alone. I'm comfortable. I like my chair. Most dads, by the way, have a chair that is theirs. My kids keep sitting in my chair. I'm going to buy another chair, right? Carl, you got your chair at the house? You do. He does. Okay, I thought so. He shares it with the dog. It with the dog. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, listen to Moses here. Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Send somebody else. Pardon your... First, he calls himself a servant. He says, pardon your servant. I'm not going. Now, that is not a servant. If Moses was honest, he would have said, Lord, the truth is, I don't want to do what you want me to do. Now, in this case, God did not lead. God pushed. In your life, 99% of the time, God will lead you. He will not force you to do anything. That's why he's the shepherd who leads us out, not the shepherd who beats us recognize whose we are. How do we make a difference? We recognize whose we are. Let me tell you something. We have a lot of folks here in a lot of homes that don't have dads at home. Or maybe they had a dad who passed away. I lost my dad at a very young age. And a man named Harold Brantley was here in, in this area, and he took me under his wing for years and years, and he said, I'll be your dad. Kristen's dad said, I'll be your dad. And there were people who were an example to me of what a dad could be, what a father could be. And let me tell you something. Get your kids, your grandkids, those neighbor's kids around some godly men. And you know a good place to do that? Right here. There are some godly men in our church. Now let me tell you something. We have one man that helps in our children's ministry. And I will tell you, it's one of the things that breaks my heart as a pastor. I would love to see some of our men step up and go, I'll help with kids. And, and I don't care if that involves you sitting there and going, I'm helping. <laughs> they need to be around some godly men who can show them what it means to be godly and to be a man. Ladies, I encourage you, get your kids, get your grandkids around some men who can show them what it's like to be a godly man. Recognize who we are. Let us live up to what we've already attained. You've already attained it. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have... What in the world is that? 
I don't even know where that came from. Is that in the notes today? Let's skip down to recognize whose we are, and then the next verse should be Philippians. It's the wrong verse? Okay, you guys can listen. <laughs> Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you ha ha have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. But our citizenship, listen, is in heaven. Do you know why sometimes you don't feel comfortable here? Because this isn't home. I don't care where you go on a trip, it's always nice to come home. You might enjoy the trip, but it's good to be home. You're not home yet. But our citizenship is heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. I want to encourage you to think of yourself less, not think less of yourself. You don't need to put yourself down to do what God wants you to, but you've got to quit thinking about your own desires first and say, God, I'm your servant. What do you want me to do? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that right now. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If today you want to surrender your life to him, knowing that you're a sinner and you need his grace, Jesus died on a cross to take our sins. He rose again so that we can live in power. And when we say, Jesus, I'm tired of living this way, I surrender my life to you. I want to follow you the rest of my life. The Bible says the great exchange takes place. And he exchanges your sinful nature for his righteous nature. He gives you the Holy Spirit so that living the Christian life is through his power and not by your own strength trying to work it out yourself. If you want to do that today, you can. If you're here today and you're a Christian and the truth is you struggle with all those thoughts of feeling like you're not good enough, you feel like you can't do things right. You struggle with your past. Surrender all that to Christ today and say, God, I will do what you call me to do today. And then follow it. Do what God's called you to do. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your power, your love, your grace. Thank you, Lord, that when we lay all of our own desires down at your feet, that, Father, you're the one who empowers us and gives us strength to overcome. Lord, I pray for that one today who's feeling so overwhelmed, not feeling worthy, not feeling like they can handle what's next. I pray even now that your Holy Spirit would give them your strength. Father, thank you for those who are here this morning. Bless each one. I pray if anyone here watching on, or watching online doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.